Woody Overton, host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Join me each week to hear true and unscripted stories of the cases I actually worked during my career as a major crime investigator in South Louisiana. Go to realliferealcrime.com where you can listen to each week's episodes and find links to our social media. I appreciate y'all. Don't let me catch you down on the bike. We are Crime Crazy, the weekly true crime podcast with Aaron Pline and Diana Seacon, where we prove that we know nothing about our legal system or shark's digestive systems or how many priests are necessary for an exorcism or the guillotine or how much milk can fit in a shopping cart or how to cook dicks or what it means when your nose itches or penguins or why it's called Scotland Yard or proper body disposal or sentencing or how to make it through an entire episode without saying God. How big does a rock have to be to be a boulder? Or geography. Or whether stingrays have teeth. Or crime in Minnesota. Or how medical parole works. Or why people text their crimes to each other. Or the hierarchy of cops. Or what a paper grabber is. Anything about an Alfred plea. The security at Buckingham Palace. If warrants expire. How to start a fire. How much drugs cost. If ducks would make good guard animals. Whether priests have to tell the police about crimes they are aware of and maybe even involved in. Pink stun guns. How much is 11 pounds of cocaine worth? The mechanics of hanging. What happened to Carla Homolka after her release? How to make a car fly. The colonial parkway killer. The swans migrate. Marital property laws in Florida. If horses can throw up. Do crocodiles hibernate? What animals can get drunk? How do you get stuck in windows? Sharks live. International flight security. How to get a typewriter into your prison cell? What you shouldn't bring to a robbery. But. We're still crazy for a good true crime story. If you don't know anything about these things either, you should come listen to Crime Crazy. Diana, do you have any advice for us? Yeah, you should subscribe to Crime Crazy. You can find us on iTunes or Google Play or Podbean or your podcast catcher of choice. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WordPress, Facebook, Gmail, or Facebook. Call your people. Yes, call your people. And don't end up on next week's episode. Hey there everyone, this is Dan, the creator and narrator of the True Crime Grapple podcast. The show has been going for almost a year and now we're finally starting to hit our stride. We have a quality sound guy providing clean audio and original music, as well as two really talented writers. So along with myself, there's three of us providing stories written in different styles. The show is bi-weekly, dropping on Tuesday and we cover cases from all over, which many of you possibly haven't heard of and some you will have such as a two-parter on James Bulger, a two-parter on the monster of Belgium, Mark Dutroux, the KFC murders from Texas, and the nightcaller, Eric Cook. Try the show out. You can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, just about everywhere. And follow our social media on Facebook and Instagram at True Crime Grapple and on Twitter at TCG3682. What are you waiting for? Come and join us. True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the True Crime Fix podcast with Stevie B. Hi everyone, and welcome to the season finale. But don't worry, I will be back. I'm just exhausted as I've been working on this show five nights a week for seven months straight, and I need a two-week break to reset. When I started doing this, I thought to myself, I would do 12 episodes, and I'd be happy if I hit a thousand downloads, and then I could say that I've at least tried this podcasting thing. I'm now obsessed And as of recording this, I have 13,000 downloads, so I can't wait to continue because I know that people out there are listening. I have had listeners from 54 different countries and I have been heard on every continent. Countries that I've only dreamt of visiting, 
places like Brazil, Hong Kong, Namibia, Argentina, Sweden and Norway. Sorry I couldn't have mentioned you all individually, but thank you for listening. The support, however, that I've received from the US, UK, Australia, Canada and New Zealand is incredible. I've been the guest on another podcast in a city like yours and I've been speaking to so many amazing people on Twitter and Facebook. In two weeks' time I'll be doing a question and answer session and a season review going over the cases that have been covered in season one. So if you have any questions that you would like answered, please contact me through the Facebook group True Crime Fix Discussion, which I also want to say a massive thank you to Jason for taking control of this for me. Direct message questions to me on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod or email me at True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. I'm also happy to answer any questions about the podcast in general as well. Anyway, that's enough of the thank yous and the business side of things. So now on to today's episode. This is your True Crime Fix. I'm your host Steve. And this case has been written in memory of Rachel McLean. She was born Rachel Margaret McLean on the 14th of August 1971 at Blackpool Victoria Hospital in Lancashire, England. Rachel was the eldest of three children born to Malcolm and Joan McLean. Joan, who was Rachel's mother, was the head of foreign language at Hodgson High School in Alton le Fylde, whilst her father Malcolm was a British aerospace engineer. Rachel had two brothers, David and Peter, who both looked up to their older sister. Although Rachel was born in Blackpool, the family lived in Carlton, which is four miles north of the seaside town. Rachel firstly attended Hodgson High School, where her mother worked, before going on to Blackpool Sixth Form College. Rachel was described as being five foot six tall. She was slim with a fresh complexion. She had shoulder length ginger auburn hair and brown eyes. Rachel obtained a grade A in her English A levels when the examiners, like her tutors, recognised her talent for writing. Jennifer Penty, who was the head of English literature at Blackpool Sixth Form College, said... T.S. Eliot was her passion and my specialism, so we worked closely together. She described her former pupil as having a positive personality despite being quiet. She was such a splendid student with a real talent for writing interesting creative pieces. Even after she left college, Rachel kept in touch with Mrs. Penty and would visit her most holidays to catch up on the news and rekindle their common interest in English literature. Jennifer recalled being one of the first people to be told by Rachel in 1990 that she had been rewarded with all of her hard work with a coveted place at Oxford University. She added, I just remember her rushing down the aisle at the church to tell me she'd got in. It is my favourite memory of her. As the oldest university in the English-speaking world, Oxford is a unique and historic institution. There is no clear date of its foundation, but teaching existed at Oxford in some form from 1096 AD and developed rapidly from 1167 AD when Henry II banned English students from attending the University of Paris. From 1878, academic halls were established for women and they were admitted to full membership of the university in 1920. Five all-male colleges first admitted women in 1974 and since then 
All colleges have changed their statuses to admit both men and women. St Hilda's College, which was originally for women only, was the last of Oxford's single-sex colleges. It has admitted both men and women since 2008. Rachel was enrolled to study English literature at St Hilda's College and started her course in September 1990. On the 13th of August 1990, Rachel met John Tanner at her 19th birthday celebrations at her home in Arenal Drive, Carlton. Although they had briefly met at his place of work, Tanner had been invited to the party as a plus one after coming to Blackpool in the summer of 1990 to visit the family of his friend Mark Rands, who he knew from Nottingham University. John Tanner was working that summer as a barman in the Adam and Eve nightclub in the town. He was three years older than Rachel, but there was an instant attraction there, and despite their universities being 102 miles apart, the pair began dating. Upon moving down to Oxford, Rachel moved into a ground floor flat in a house at 25 Argyle Street, which is in the town of Cowley. She shared the house with four other female students. Cowley is an area with a lot of student accommodation as it has easy access to the city centre. She adored the historic city and when Rachel had settled in she decided to go out so she could get her bearings, walking the streets for hours taking in all of the sights and sounds. Rachel loved university life and during her time at Oxford she committed to the social side of university life as well as the academic. Rachel was a vegetarian, devout Christian and strong environmentalist. She soon made an impact on her fellow Oxford students, leading to her being selected Vice President of St Hilda's College Junior Common Room after serving as its entertainment's representative. The role involved speaking on behalf of 364 undergraduates in regular meetings with the college authorities. Rachel was described by friends as being streetwise, sensible and fun. Whilst carrying out her duties as Vice President, Rachel helped draw up a sexual harassment code of complaints procedure with the Dean of the College. This set of bylaws ultimately changed the lives of a number of women at the university. Rachel was an avid churchgoer and was also a member of Oxford Union and the Industrial Society. She also made time for her voluntary work with Christian Aid and the Samaritans. Rachel had also obtained the Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award. Now, I obtained the Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award when I was 14. To get the award, you need to partake in three months' worth of volunteering. Have a hobby which involves a skill, for example, music, sports, arts, crafts, those sort of things. And again, that needs to be three months in duration. Then take part in physical recreation for three months. That can be things like being part of a football team, being part of a netball team, being part of a cricket team, anything like that. You also need to plan and take part in an adventurous journey which lasts two days and one night with an average of six hours purposeful effort every single day. So, for example, we went orienteering in the hills of the Brecon Beacons, had to camp overnight and cook our own food on campfires, that sort of thing. Rachel also had a love for heavy metal rock music and was a member of the university's rock society. Rachel and Tanner appeared to everyone to have a stable, loving relationship. During their second years at their respective universities, 
Tanner would call Rachel several times a week, write her letters, and they would visit each other at weekends. Rachel's housemates would comment that they spent all their time locked up in her bedroom, only coming out for food. In the spring of 1991, Rachel was nearing the end of her second year of university and John Tanner went down to visit her on Saturday the 13th of April. It was just after the Easter break and the house was not yet filled with her flatmates as they had not yet returned from their breaks. Rachel spent the day with her mother who had driven her the 205 miles from her home to Oxford after the holidays. Her mother left her at 4pm to drive back to Blackpool and on the evening of the 13th of April 1991 Tanner was due to arrive in Oxford by train at 6pm. Rachel went to meet him at the station, but upon discovering that the train had been delayed, she returned home. At around 7.30pm, Tanner arrived at the house by taxi, and he said he was greeted with a hug and a kiss. That night, ten months to the day since they had met, John Tanner proposed to Rachel and she excitedly accepted. The next day they planned to spend the day at home. Sunday the 14th of April was FA Cup semi-final day and Nottingham Forest fan Tanner watched the FA Cup semi-final against West Ham which was held at Villa Park at Argyle Street whilst Rachel studied in the living room. As Nottingham Forest won the game 4-0, putting them through to the 1991 FA Cup final against Tottenham, Tanner was in a very good mood. After the game, the couple were seen by neighbours outside the house at around 4.30pm, before going back inside. John Tanner left the house the next day to return to Nottingham, where he was a classics student at the city's university. On Tuesday the 16th of April, Tanner telephoned Rachel at her house but there was no answer. He tried again the following evening and it was answered by Victoria Clare who was one of Rachel's housemates. Tanner asked to speak to Rachel but Victoria said that she had not seen her but would leave a message on her bedroom door. Tanner had written a letter to Rachel on the train home and that letter arrived on the 18th of April. When Victoria had returned home on Wednesday the 17th of April, following her Easter holidays, she had said that the windows of Rachel's room were open and her clothes were there. Tanner had called the house again on the evening of the 18th of April asking for Rachel, but again her flatmates had not heard anything from her. On the 19th of April, after Rachel had not been seen for five days, Rachel's friends were concerned as to where she was. Rachel was due to attend a private session with her tutor that morning to discuss work for the new term and sit a pre-term exam at St Hilda's in the afternoon. When Rachel failed to attend, the university made a telephone call to the McLean family in Lancashire. They confirmed that she had not been home since she had been dropped off in Oxford the previous weekend. College authorities notified police about Rachel's apparent disappearance. Initially, the inquiry was low-key, as Oxford police received dozens of reports of missing students every month. Rachel's description was circulated to local patrols and the police said that they would keep an eye out for her. On the 21st of April, the Criminal Investigation Department, or CID, took control of the inquiry and an initial search of Rachel's student accommodation was made by detectives. There was nothing to suggest she had come to any harm at the house and detectives even went to the lengths of examining the floorboards which showed that they had not been tampered with. 
One thing that was noticed during the initial search of Rachel's room was that her keys were still inside on her desk. This was a strong indication that it was unlikely that Rachel had left voluntarily. Police eventually got in touch with John Tanner on Monday the 22nd of April and he told officers that he had last seen Rachel at 5pm on the previous Monday at Oxford Station when she had come to see him off. When asked about their relationship, Tanner said that they had a very physical relationship. In a police statement he gave, he said that they often had sex seven times a night and claimed that on the last weekend they had had sex three times on the Saturday evening, seven times on the Sunday night and again on the Monday. Rachel's disappearance was made public knowledge on the 22nd of April. Tanner made a statement from his home in Lenton in Nottinghamshire, describing how he had given Rachel a farewell kiss on platform two of Oxford's railway station as he boarded his train home. He also explained how he and Rachel had been joined by a long-haired man as they sat drinking coffee on the station concourse. He said the stranger seemed to know Rachel well and offered her a lift home and even provided police with information and sat with a sketch artist to create a photo fit of the man. Rachel's parents, Joan and Malcolm, took part in a press conference on the 24th of April 1991 and appealed for help finding their daughter. Meanwhile, the police continued to search the areas around Argyle Street and nearby Shrubland. Police frogmen dragged the River Sherwell, but the searches came up empty-handed. Police issued the photo-fit picture of the man whom Tanner claimed to have met them at Oxford Station, but nobody came forward to place him at the station with Rachel and himself. By the 28th of April, police were convinced that Rachel was dead and ordered the search teams to examine sewers and cesspits around the area of Argyle Street. Once again, the search came up empty-handed. The following day, Tanner surprised police by agreeing to take part in a press conference and reconstruction of what he claimed were their final moments. Police were growing increasingly suspicious of John Tanner. They decided that they would use the occasion of the TV press conference to try and catch him out. Police briefed journalists at the conference to pose questions to Tanner in a way that would ultimately reinforce their suspicion that Tanner was involved in the disappearance. This was done prior to his arrival, without his knowledge, to put pressure on him to see how he would react. Flanked by detectives, Tanner calmly entered the room at Oxford Police Station and asked for help in tracing his missing girlfriend. When one reporter asked him to give a message to anyone holding Rachel against her will, Tanner looked into the cameras and said, I would appeal to them to come forward and tell us where she is, just out of sheer consideration for her mother and father and myself. When he was questioned as to whether Rachel was still alive, he replied, In my heart of hearts, I would like to think so. But the key question was left right to the very end, and I'll let you hear it in Tanner's own words. You know, whether anything that's sinister that's happened to Rachel involved yourself? Not at all, no, not to my knowledge. As, you, as far as you're concerned, you're quite clear in your mind that you, last, you went on the train and that was it, and you don't know anything more about it? Absolutely. To raise awareness, and in the search for new leads, the police wanted to role-play Tanner's recollections of the last time that he saw Rachel. During an hour-long reenactment, WPC Helen Kay played
played Rachel's role. John Tanner dressed in what he had worn on that day, a rock band t-shirt, black leather jacket, ripped blue jeans and a sports holdall over his shoulder. He took his time and posed in the station cafe, strolled along the platform and replayed the final embrace and the kiss they shared before boarding the train. Pressed by reporters who had descended on Oxford train station, Tanner said, I did not kill her. I don't know what happened to her. In my heart of hearts, I know she is still alive. The reconstruction had the desired effect the police wanted. Two independent witnesses placed John Tanner at the station, but not Rachel. With a strong suspicion about who their prime suspect was, but no Rachel or substantial evidence against him, at the beginning of May, the police contacted Oxfordshire County Council for details regarding the layout of the houses in Argyle Street, particularly about their basements. Although they were told that there were no basements in the houses, an official remembered that the houses were underpinned, which meant that there were cavities under the floor. Giving the police a new place to search, a day later, on the 2nd of May, Rachel's body was found shortly before 5.30pm. It was covered in pieces of carpet, but due to it not having been very warm, there was no decomposition on the body. Within the hour, a shocked John Tanner was arrested at a pub in Nottingham. Initially, Tanner refused to answer any of the questions, proceeding with a no-comment interview. During a second police interview, the police presented him with evidence. A bus ticket had been found in his belongings for the number 40 double-decker bus from Rachel's house to Oxford Station. After a brief search of his belongings, the police had found this apparently innocuous ticket, but they carried out an investigation with the company that operated the route. The issue for Tanner's narrative of events was that the bus company kept a digital record of all the passengers who got on and off at specific stops along the route, which for 1991 was an innovative practice. According to the information provided, on the 5pm bus which Tanner took from Rachel's house to Oxford Station, no one got on the bus with him and no one got off with him at his destination. Confronted with this new information, Tanner broke and confessed to killing Rachel. He wrote his own statement, which said that Rachel had ended their engagement, and when she had told him why she didn't want to be engaged anymore, he had been offended and his mind must have snapped. According to Tanner, the events of the 14th of April 1991 went as follows. After Rachel had accepted his proposal the night before, that evening they were in her bedroom and Rachel had told him that she no longer wanted to accept his offer of marriage. He said she had told him that she had slept with other people. Tanner claimed he called her a tart in response. He claimed she made as if to strike him and he then just lost control. Although Tanner could not remember the exact time Rachel was killed, he confirmed that it was at some point that night. Tanner stated that he had strangled Rachel with his bare hands and then forced her head down and tied a ligature which he thought was a tie around her neck. Tanner said he lifted Rachel's body from the floor onto the bed and spent the night awake on the floor. In his confession, Tanner told detectives that he had spent several hours looking for a hiding place for the body in the house. Ironically, it had been Rachel 
who showed Tana the perfect hiding spot for her body. A crawl space in a cupboard under the stairs by where the hoover was kept, which went under the floorboards of the entire downstairs. The next morning, Monday the 15th of April, he decided that he had to hide the body. He emptied the cupboard under the stairs and then dragged Rachel's body, clothed in ski pants and a t-shirt, from her bedroom, along the hall and into the space under the floor. He then crawled along under the hallway and hid the body directly under the floorboards of her bedroom. When he had done this, he replaced all of the items under the stairs to make it look as if nothing had happened. That afternoon, he used the bus ticket and he took the bus to Oxford Station to catch the 6.55 train back to Nottingham. While he was waiting and whilst on the train, he wrote a letter to Rachel. This was his first attempt to make it appear as if she was still alive. The letter began. My dearest lovely Rachel, Thank you for such a wonderful weekend. Please excuse the handwriting as I am now sadly wending my way away from your smiling face. He then went on to pretend that Rachel had been at the station and that a male friend of hers had given her a lift home. This was the lie which he would repeat when questioned by police. He continued in the letter. Fancy seeing that friend of yours at the station. It was nice of him to give you a lift. But I hate him because he has longer hair than me. Ha 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 ha. He later added, It's nice to know that you will not be alone for the next few days. I worry about you in that house on your own. Tanner returned to his home in Metham Street in Lenton which is one and a half miles away from Nottingham City Centre. The following day, Tuesday, April the 16th, he had posted the letter he had written. In the coming days, Tanner would phone Rachel's home twice to ask if she was there and also wrote her a second letter saying, I have tried calling you all week, but I guess the Bordelian Library has you in its grasp. A call would be appreciated. Both of the letters Tanner had written after Rachel had been killed. In total, it had taken police teams 17 days to locate Rachel's body. So what do we know about John Tanner? He was born in Aldershot, Hampshire in January 1969, but moved to New Zealand at an early age with parents Bill and Jan. They moved to the city of Wanganui, where he graduated from Wanganui Collegiate. Tanner travelled back and forth between England and New Zealand between 1986 and 1989 until he started a classics course at Nottingham University. At the university, he hosted a twice-weekly show called The Fast Lane, on University Radio Nottingham. He was a popular student and was elected the Student Union representative for the Sherwood Hall of Residence. Tanner was also a talented footballer, having played for New Zealand at schoolboy level and played regular Saturday matches at the university's Grove Farm sports ground in Lenton Lane. Tanner initially appeared before Oxford Magistrates Court on Saturday the 4th of May and was charged with the murder of Rachel McLean. During his initial appearance before magistrates, Tanner entered a plea of not guilty, saying that he had not intended to kill Rachel and therefore meant that the case needed to proceed to trial. On Thursday the 9th of May, an inquest into Rachel's death was opened by the Crown Prosecution Service 
and it was adjourned on the same day. The cause of death was determined to be manual strangulation. On Sunday the 12th of May, ten days after the discovery of Rachel's body, a memorial service was held at the University Church of St Mary the Virgin in Oxford. 400 of Rachel's family and friends attended the service. On Wednesday the 29th of May 1991, Rachel's body was returned to her home in Lancashire for the final time. A funeral service was held at Paulton Methodist Church where Rachel was eulogised by her former Sunday school teacher Kathleen Sutcliffe before being laid to rest at Paulton Moorland Road Cemetery. On the 2nd of December 1991, John Tanner's trial began at Birmingham Crown Court and the trial lasted for four days. During his trial, Tanner said that Rachel had told him she wanted to end the relationship as she had been unfaithful. I flew at her in a rage and proceeded to put my hands around her neck, Tanner said during his initial police interview, which was read to the court. I think I must have lost control because I only have vague recollection of the time that elapsed afterwards. I'm bewildered why I have done such a terrible thing to a person I love dearly. Although Tanner tried to give the impression that his and Rachel's relationship was perfect prior to the murder, the prosecution had evidence to the contrary. Excerpts of Rachel's diary, which were entered as evidence at the trial, revealed that she actually had a deep loathing for her boyfriend. She wrote, What a joke. I just wrote in John's Valentine's Day card. Full of sweet, pure words. Words that I shoveled out from some fountain inside me. A fountain which is cracked and dried. Later she added, Somehow, I don't think he would have appreciated sweet nothings along the lines of you sick, childish bastard. I hope your admiration for yourself lasts forever and ever. You are so busy generating self-pity that you cannot see how you slice me to pieces. Tanner's true feelings were shown in a letter he wrote to her in 1991. He wrote, All I feel is anger and rejection. I love you, you know that. Why do you not want me? I shall not give you up. He also told the court that Rachel had taunted him when he was unable to perform sexually because of pains in his groin and abdomen. But ultimately, the evidence portrayed him as a violent and possessive man who only thought of himself and how situations affected him. When Tanner was asked in court whether it had occurred to him to try and help revive Rachel or try and seek medical help after he had attacked her, he said, The situation was so unusual. There was no necessity to try and revive her because I thought, myself, she was not dead. As I was in a highly stressed state, I was probably more concerned with myself. This is evidence that even at the time of Rachel's death, Tanner only thought about himself. Only John Tanner knows what actually was said on that night in the flat at 25 Argyle Road and whether Rachel did actually tell him that she had been unfaithful. But there seems little doubt that Tanner was possessive he initially admitted as much to the police himself, saying that the obsession would take the form of my asking who she had been with. This caused friction between us and one or two arguments, but nothing serious. Despite having admitted his obsession to the police when interviewed, in court he turned this around and said that the fact that he was being caring, not possessive, he said, 
Because I actively showed that I wanted to care for her. Because I actively promised to care for her, as long as I could. I do not construe this as possessiveness. I construe that as caring for somebody that you love. Regardless of the spin that Tanner tried to put on this behaviour, on the 6th of December 1991, the jury took four and a half hours to convict him of murder. The jury had rejected the lesser charge of manslaughter. The judge, upon sentencing, handed Tanner a life sentence. Outside the court, Rachel's parents spoke to the waiting press. They told how they forgave Tanner for his actions. Rachel's mother Joan said, I think we feel the way that we have always felt, that this is a tragedy for him in his life as well. I think we can forgive him, because otherwise it eats into your life and the lives of others around you. If you start on the path of forgiveness, you can start to build a new life and all the people around you can build their new lives. So this case was 28 years ago. What has happened to the key people from this case? Oxford University started the Rachel McLean Prize. The prize is awarded annually to the member of the St Hilda's Junior Common Room who has improved junior common room life and or raised the profile of the junior common room student community within the university. The award is a fitting tribute to Rachel and how active she was within the university. As for Tanner, he served 12 years at Gartree Prison in Leicestershire. Whilst incarcerated, he started a relationship with a female criminology student who wrote to him continuously throughout his sentence. He was released in 2003 and decided to leave England behind and return to live with her in Whanganui in New Zealand. Upon his release, that relationship did not last, however, and she returned to the UK. Following his return to New Zealand, Tanner stayed out of trouble and lived a quiet, law-abiding life. Or so you would like to think. But guess what? In late 2016, early 2017, John Tanner physically and emotionally abused his most recent girlfriend a number of times over a six-month period. The acts of abuse included using his hands to restrict her breathing on more than one occasion. So, my dear listener, does that sound familiar? This culminated in another incident which landed him in trouble with the New Zealand authorities. In May 2017, Tanner argued with his girlfriend while she was staying in a motel in the town of Wanganui, according to a report in the New Zealand Herald. He straddled his girlfriend on the bed during an argument and proceeded to slap and punch her head with a closed fist before leaving. Several hours later, when Tanner's partner sent a text telling him that the relationship was over, he went back to her hotel, ripped her clothes off and demanded sex. He then hit her several more times in the head. Despite the assaults, a victim impact statement indicated that she wanted the relationship to continue and said she wanted Tanner to get help with his anger issues. The girl, who could not be named, was described as brilliant, highly principled and a considerable poet and she could look forward to a bright future. The judge said that during a different argument, the partner said she was leaving Tanner and he replied that she would not do that or he would kill her. 
She did not take the threat seriously. Judge Philip Creighton said when he sentenced Tanner to two years and nine months for the attack. Another example of where life imprisonment should mean that. So that's it for this season. Thank you again to everyone for making my little dream become a reality. During my absence, the previous episodes are still available to be listened to on your podcatcher and we have covered some eye-opening and heartbreaking stories in our debut season. We have come a long way since the release of Zafia's story on the 1st of February. Please remember to subscribe so that when the new episodes are released, they will automatically download for you. If you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter, at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. Or look out for our Facebook page, True Crime Fix Discussion. I'll be posting information about the week's case on there. I also have an Instagram account, so search True Crime Fix. I always post pictures of the key people from the case on there, so in case you're like me and curious to know what the people you are hearing about look like, I will post them on there. Also, if you have any constructive suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me at truecrimefixpodcast at gmail.com. That's True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest, because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone.